Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Professor Paul Cartledge, the president of the Hellenic Society, Society for the Promotion of Hellenic Studies. This is a joint event with our sister society, the Society for the Promotion of Roman Studies, of which the president is Tim Cornell, who I believe is uh, with us this afternoon. I was uh, elected president middle of last year in extraordinary uh, COVID ridden circumstances. And one of the first things that occurred to me was that somehow or other, we must address what was clearly a growing area of concern, namely the nature of classics, uh, how to define it, how to reach out from it, or how perhaps to uh, revalue it from a certain process of introspection. And I myself actually blogged quite early on, uh, throwing out some suggestions. But one of the first things I did, I'm very pleased I did, was to commission Feroz, Feroz Vasunia, to uh, do what he has in fact done so brilliantly, which is to gather together uh, a terrific panel and to organize this event, uh, race, colon, antiquity and its legacy. Now, we're not exactly unfamiliar with that topic within our subject, just within my lifetime, going back to the 80s, a certain Martin Bernal, no longer with us, but uh, he threw a cat among the pigeons with his Black Athena project. And I myself, actually, I knew Martin personally quite well, and I debated with him not once, but twice publicly, partly purely technically. In other words, was the basis of his claim uh, historiographically uh, scholastically correct, because he was not himself uh, a classicist, he was a sinologist, as it happened, a professor of uh, Chinese government at uh, Cornell, if I remember right. So we have as our chair today, um, Feroz Vasunia, Professor of Greek at University College London, a most distinguished chair. Its previous occupants include, for example, Professor Pat Easterling, Feroz has himself a most distinguished career, and he has, of course, both edited and written solo many very important books, including The Classics and Colonial India, Oxford Press, 2013, and his principal convener of the Comparative Classicism Project. So without further ado, I hand over to him and he will give us um, a little inkling as to how he's going to proceed and uh, it's entirely in his hands. Thank you, Feroz. Um, thanks, Paul. Thank you for the introduction. I'd like to add my greetings to Paul's and send my warmest welcome to those of you who joined our session from wherever you may be. And I can see from the list of attendees that some of you are very far from where I am uh, and in very different time zones too. Um, Paul has already reminded us about the importance of the subject, so let's simply move right to the program, Race, Antiquity and Its Legacy. Our panelists will talk for about 12 to 15 minutes each, then we'll open the session to your comments and questions. This means in practice that after about 45 minutes from now, there'll be time for discussion. You should be able to write your questions and comments in the Q&A box on the screen. And I think for most of you, this will be at the bottom of, your, of the Zoom window. Uh, and I'll do my best to moderate the discussion. The panel, as you know, consists of three distinguished scholars, Zina Kamash, Denise Mikoski, and Danelle Padilla Peralta. And we're going to be starting with Zina. Zina Kamash is a British Iraqi archaeologist and senior lecturer in archaeology at Royal Holloway University of London. She's an expert in the archaeology and heritage of the Middle East. Her research focuses on people-centered approaches to post-conflict reconstruction in the Middle East, and she's writing a book entitled, I believe, Time for Healing Cultural Heritage in Post-Conflict Syria and Iraq. Today, she will be talking about rebalancing Roman archaeology and will give a brief snapshot of some of the data that she's gathered on Roman archaeology conferences and teaching. So over to you, Zina. Uh, 
Thank you, Faroz, for that very generous introduction. I'm going to try and share my screen and hopefully this all goes, oh, host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Wonder if we might be able to um, undisable that for my talk. I'll, I'll start talking while we maybe sort that out. Um, uh, so what I'm going to talk to you about today is based on a much longer um, uh, piece of work that I put together for the um, Theoretical Roman Archaeology Conference in 2019 when I was the, the keynote uh, lecturer. Um, so I'm going to try and uh, give you a, a pithy overview um, of that work. Um, and aha, I think I can do the screen share so I can show you some slides. Right. Okay, so hopefully you can now all see a beautiful blue background with some words on it. You can. Excellent. <laughs> Good news. Right, so uh, I'm going to look at the state of the discipline of Roman archaeology through two lenses um, and only through very small parts of those lenses today. Um, so I'm going to start with the conference data from theoretical Roman archaeology conferences and Roman archaeology conferences. Uh, and then uh, a teaching survey that I sent out to Roman archaeologists globally, uh, which um, I didn't realise at the time, but ended up with the acronym RATS. Um, uh, and that allows us to see some more attitudes. I then want to very briefly share some um, personal stories of my own about being a woman of colour um, in archaeology in the UK. And then I want to end with some suggestions for things that you can also do um, to um, contribute to rebalancing, uh, not just Roman archaeology, but your own disciplines and indeed the wider um, public society that we live in. So I'm not going to talk through all of the numbers on this slide, I just want to give you a sense of the data set um, that I was um, playing around with. Um, so uh, looked at 27 conferences, they predominantly um, uh, have been hosted in the global north um, and there's quite a substantial data set. Um, as you look at that data, the benchmark that I have used is the UK census in 2011. I appreciate that this is going to be a little bit different um, across the world, but this is the, this is the uh, benchmark that I've used. So the white ethnic group in uh, the UK in 2011 made up 86% of the population. So we should be looking, if we're trying to find black and global majority people, uh, for about 15%. Unfortunately, that is very much not what we find in the conference data. Um, we find substantially uh, lower than that, uh, with session organisers and paper presenters um, below 3%. Um, though there was, uh, in 2019, when I gave the keynote, a wonderful 10.9%, but that was actually only three people uh, at the conference. So we're still talking tiny numbers. So in order to reach that 15% threshold, we'd be wanting somewhere around 78 more session organizers and 365 more paper presenters. Now there are some issues with the data set that I'm using, um, but um, I'm fairly confident that these are accurate numbers and that those additional 78 and 365 people just don't exist. Um, and um, uh, so this is worrying and is something that we need to attend to. Um, there are also issues around intersectionality. Um, so uh, men um, who are uh, black or from global majority populations are three times more likely than women from that same community uh, to be a session organiser. So there are issues around kind of women taking more senior roles um, in conferences. Um, and just to give you two um, dates to, to think about. So 2010 uh, was the first session organized by a, a black or global minority, uh, majority, sorry, woman, uh, it was me. Um, and then 29 was the first time that anybody um, uh, who might identify as black and global majority who gave a keynote. Um, again, that was me. Um, this is not a crown I've ever particularly set out to, um, uh, to wear. Um, and indeed, I wish that there had been numerous people before me um, who had um, uh, lit that path that I might then follow. 
So just to look at one aspect of some of the content of the um, conferences. Um, so what parts of the Roman Empire or just beyond its borders are we discussing? So if we look at um, uh, sessions or, uh, by synthesized region, so I've had to collapse some of the data down for obvious reasons. At first, it looks like we might be in fairly good shape. There's that big 69%, that big orange um, part of the pie is open sessions, i.e. with no specified particular region. So that should mean that we get lots and lots of lovely little bits here and there from all across the Roman world and just beyond its frontiers um, coming and um, making part of our um, research culture at the conference. But, does open really mean open? And I'm afraid that the answer is quite an emphatic no. So if we look at um, the papers that are then in those sessions, we can see you've got that big bar for Europe um, taking up most of the um, uh, a large part of the um, number of papers. And if we look at that um, by selected regions, Britain and Italy are making up 47% of the conference papers, um, leaving the entire rest of the Roman Empire and beyond its borders at 53%. So two very small provinces taking up nearly 50% of everything we're talking about. That's quite staggering, I think. Um, so moving on now to the teaching survey, um, again, I'm not going to talk particularly through these numbers, I just want to give you an idea of, uh, of the data set. Um, one thing to notice is that the uh, RAT survey did manage to get um, people who hadn't necessarily been to a, a, a Roman archaeology or theoretical Roman archaeology conference, so we've got some a little bit of checks and balances in the data there. Um, so looking again at place, um, so these are specialised regional courses and this is worldwide. Um, and again, we see a, a very, very similar number. So Britain and Italy, 49% combined of specialised regional courses that have been taught. So again, taking up nearly 50% of what we're teaching. And we can see there uh, a really close um, uh, uh, relationship between our research cultures and our teaching cultures. Um, so what we were able to do in the teaching survey that I couldn't get from the um, uh, from looking at the conference data is a little bit more qualitative data. So I was able to ask people why they taught certain places. So a lot of people said they just didn't have the right knowledge. Uh, and one person in particular made um, uh, quite an insightful comment, um, which was that they pointed out that they hadn't been taught those areas as an undergraduate. Now, of course, a cycle exists where what we're taught as an undergraduate inspires us to go on to do particular research topics, which are then what we talk about at conferences and also what we go on to teach ourselves. And that's a natural cycle. But if that cycle doesn't get new bits of input at the teaching end, it never changes. And we just keep churning out lots and lots of people doing lots and lots of research on Britain and Italy. And there's nothing wrong with doing research on Britain and Italy, but there's a beautiful, big, exciting Roman Empire out there with lots of other areas in it. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, there's also some interesting elements around what topics are taught. And again, this, this was reflected in the conference data, but I just focused on, on this bit for now. Um, so at that lower end, uh, marked in green on the slide, uh, we have topics where we might uh, potentially um, teach with a more progressive agenda. So if we want to deal with topics like multiculturalism um, and anti-racism and issues around that, um, we're going to be looking to be teaching topics that lend themselves to that. And predominantly those are lying at the bottom end of what we're teaching. Um, uh, and we're also um, ethics, for example, in the conference, no one had ever done a, a session on ethics. Um, so again, asking the question why, why or why not? Um, a little bit of passing the buck happening here, not enough time, other people teach them. Um, 
Uh, and again, looking at some of the uh, more specific comments, um, I find this one quite interesting. Um, so there's no time for it. We barely have time to install the essentials. Now that's really interesting, I think, because who decides on what is essential to teach? Now, for those of us who are in permanent positions, we generally are able to um, uh, dictate the content of our courses. We decide <laughs> what is essential. If we feel there's some other canon out there that has developed, we also need to, to query that and question it. How did it come about? Does it need to be changed? Does it need to adapt? Um, and I'd also like to just uh, uh, point out another comment. Uh, this person was quite vocal uh, throughout the survey um, and twice referred to what I was doing as bullshit political correctness. So this is within our own discipline. So this isn't a problem that we need to think about outside of our discipline. This comes from within. Um, and I'm afraid that bullshit guy <laughs> is, is wrong. It, it does matter. Um, and it matters because it matters to our students. So I um, took uh, my cue from um, some of the work that Catherine Bluin has been doing uh, and did a little experiment in some of my teaching with my first years. Um, and in response to that experiment, I got this feedback from one of my students. And I'll be honest, I actually did a little happy dance when I read this because, oh, you know, this is a win. Somebody in my room felt welcome because of the way I had taught. It was a tiny change that had been made and it was so easy to do um, and it works. Um, and that feeling of being welcome is sort of what I want to share now with my it's not okay slide. Um, uh, because it hasn't always been uh, welcoming for me um, in uh, archaeology in the UK. Um, so it's not okay uh, to query whether I'm a native speaker. Um, I actually am, I grew up in the UK. Um, uh, and judging me just on the basis of my name and therefore assuming that I can't write English um, yeah, is a little bit problematic. Um, I get this all the time. Apparently I don't look Iraqi enough for everybody. Um, uh, the particular low point was when it was said to me by an equality and diversity officer. Um, uh, I recently discovered that Andy Serkis is Iraqi, <laughs> so he's now going to be my go-to response. Uh, but actually, it shouldn't matter whether I look like Andy Serkis or I look like another Iraqi, you know, who's to say what an Iraqi looks like or anybody else for that matter? What I look like doesn't matter. Um, uh, yeah, jokes about lying, cheating Arabs, I'm afraid they're not funny um, and uh, they really shouldn't be addressed to anybody. Um, I also never want to be asked this question again, uh, and just in case you're in any doubt, the Middle East definitely counts as classics. Um, and uh, yeah, if you're asking this question, even if just to play devil's advocate, think twice and, and please don't. Um, and uh, yes, a particular low point where for several weeks on a, an, an, on a deployment list, uh, I had been anglicised to Zoe Kenmarsh because the person producing the list didn't think that Zena Kamash could be a real name. Um, so if you hear this kind of behaviour, I, I call on you to, to call it out. Um, some of this might seem maybe quite small. These are microaggressions. Um, you might even think some of them are funny, um, but I can promise you that actually they're draining. They use far more of my resource than I have to go around. Um, and I have better things to do with my time. Um, so this brings me to what you can do. Um, uh, and I know that some people listening, maybe not, um, uh, maybe not classicists and are just listening out of interest, but you can also uh, make some changes in your, in your wider world. Um, so you could pick any one of these boxes. So this is the complexity of the problem. Um, even though the British government's recent report would like us to think that it's, it's not as complicated as this. So you could pick 
editorial boards of uh, journals um, and start to do some work on that. Um, you could think about cost of living inequalities for whether people can move into particular parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. Also some specific things you could do if you're organizing a conference. These were made specifically thinking about Roman archeology span conferences, but apply more broadly. So think about diversifying participation. There's lots of accessibility and inclusivity guidance available um, around not doing manals or wannels. Um, so male only panels and white only panels. In fact, Sarah May, uh, just before I started um, in this panel discussion, wrote a wonderful Twitter thread about how she's going to call out all the wannels and wannels that she sees. Um, more diversity in our research content. Um, and then there are the big structural issues that are really reflected in that um, uh, diagram that I just showed around access to funding. Freedom of movement is a huge problem, massive issues around visa inequalities that you can see coming through in the conference data. Um, and then teaching, maybe take an implicit bias test, find out a little bit about yourself. Um, you could freshen your teaching, learn a new region if you're doing a big kind of first year survey course maybe try another few little different case studies that needn't take up a huge amount of your time. Again, there's some wonderful examples on the Everyday Orientalism blog uh, with lots of inspirational content. And please sit and think about what is essential. And just generally be a good ally. Again, if you're not quite sure how to do that, Mother Oma Chandran has a wonderful fiery piece in a dolon with lots of good suggestions, which basically boils down to please do the work. We need allies. Um, it can't all fall on the shoulders of a small number of people. Um, so my final slide then is just to thank my own allies and supporters um, who have got me this far. Thank you to all of you and thank you for listening. I'm now going to try and stop sharing <laughs> so that we can get back to the screen. There we go. Thank you very much. Great, great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Zina. Thanks very much. Um, just to remind everyone that we're going to hold questions and comments until the discussion, until all three of our speakers have finished. And then at that point, we'll open up. If you'd like to type your questions in the meantime, do go ahead. Uh, please do so. But we'll, we'll only take them up uh, at the end of the three presentations. We're going to move on to Denise McCoskey. Denise is a professor of classics at Miami University in Ohio. She's written extensively on the politics of race and gender and antiquity. And she is, in fact, the author of a book from which our panel draws its title and inspiration, uh, namely Race, Antiquity and Its Legacy. Yes, Donnell is holding up the book there just in case you've, you've uh, not seen it. It's one of the few up-to-date books on the subject. Today, she's going to be speaking about race in the study of classical antiquity and we'll be talking about the general avoidance of the race word in classical studies and why it needs to be used. Denise. Okay, great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen, I hope. <clears throat> so I wanna thank the Hellenic and Roman societies for sponsoring this event. And of course, Feroz for all the organizational work behind the scenes. I'm really excited to be here with my fellow panelists and I, Look forward very much to the discussion. For my opening contribution, I'd like to think about the concept of race and why in classical studies, it has had such a difficult career to borrow a term from the philosopher Lucius Outlaw. I wanna start with some of my own experiences, especially the fact that over the past decades, I've heard the same refrain from colleagues in classics more times than I can count. Namely, that race is not relevant to study of the ancient world. While such statements are not generally followed by any explanation or attempt at genuine discussion, I've come to realize that they almost always rely on fundamental misconceptions about what race is and how it functions. Misconceptions that have long been debunked outside the field of classics. I first became aware of the enormous gap between classics and the rest of academia when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, a time when critical race theory was having a transformative effect on just about every other discipline in the social sciences and humanities, especially in the United States. 
And you may have heard the phrase critical race theory in recent times, given the attempts by US government officials and right-wing media to both greatly distort its aims and also silence it. Indeed, just last week, the fine minds at the Wall Street Journal opinion page used the term as a lightning rod for their attack on the US ambassador to the United Nations, who had merely observed that in reaffirming slavery, the governments that established America as a nation had enshrined white supremacy as one of its founding principles. So back to me. During my graduate school years, I was very fortunate to be able to pursue coursework outside my department with a multiracial and interdisciplinary group of graduate students who were all deeply invested in integrating the study of race into their home disciplines. But those conversations stood in stark contrast to my experiences within classics, where the word race was never mentioned at all. And I'm going to leave aside Black Athena, as Paul talked about, although that may come up in the discussion. But what was important to me is it, it wasn't that classical historians were avoiding the topic of collective identity in the 90s, but rather that adoption of terminology like ethnicity was becoming the principal framework for such investigation. As was often noted at the time, ethnicity as a concept had emerged following the Second World War as a way of designating a group identity that was mobilized through active social performances, such as the employment of a particular label like Greek or the speaking of a particular language. While this scholarship made and continues to make significant contributions to classics, it almost never, and there were notable exceptions, but almost never acknowledged that critical race theorists were at the same time calling attention to the ways the emergence of ethnicity had largely been predicated on a fundamental misreading of race. For ethnicity had gained its ground both inside and outside the academy, largely through its positioning against the concept of race, Indeed, it was often explicitly evoked as a replacement for race, which was characterized conversely as an identity that was both passively acquired and biological rather than social. This notion that race is a product of human biology has long dominated the public imaginary, and it continues to hold widespread authority still today. Yet as Robert Wald Sussman points out, this view of race remains so firmly embedded in our culture because like racism itself, the notion that race is biological has been, quote, an integral part of our worldview for so long that many of us just assume it must be true, end quote. But it is not true. For assessment elaborates, research in fields like biology, anthropology, and genetics has demonstrated conclusively over the past decades that, quote, biological races do not exist among modern humans today, and they have never existed in the past, end quote. Moreover, this general consensus among scientists that race is social and not biological has only been strengthened by the mapping of the human genome. In other words, scientists have now affirmed what critical race theorists and historians have been arguing for decades, namely that race is not an inherent or natural product of the human body, but rather the product of shifting ideas about how and why groups and sometimes bodies are different ideas that emerge from and are deeply related to their own time and place. Contrary to the convenient, albeit dangerously misguided, treatment of race and ethnicity as contrasting modes of identity formation then, as Stuart Hall observed decades ago, the two terms actually, quote, play hide and seek with each other, end quote. I do not intend here at all to demean the use of ethnicity by classical scholars only to insist that we need to have a much clearer understanding of the false foundations upon which it has claimed so much of its authority. Moreover, critical race theory has demonstrated not only that race is not biological, but that it is also not a historical or universal, meaning that ideas about race have changed over time as historical conditions shift and different groups and modes of encounters between groups emerge and evolve. Lucius Outlaw has proposed that, quote, the career of race emerges from a general need to account for the unfamiliar or simply to classify objects of experiences, thus to organize the life world, end quote. Yet he and other critical race theorists have identified the modern 18th and 19th centuries as a crucial turning point in the ways race has been conceptualized. As Outlaw explains, and I'm modifying this slightly, Quote, a new stage in race's career developed in the 18th century when evidence from geology, zoology, anatomy, and other fields of scientific inquiry 
was assembled to support a claim that racial classification would help explain human differences, end quote. Far from being objective, this establishment of a scientific framework for defining race was soon eagerly employed in the justification of European colonialism and the rise of the transatlantic slave trade. Yet it is precisely this subjective turn to science or more often pseudoscience in deliberating the origins and meanings of racial difference that we have come to take for granted today. So too, in the 21st century, we continue too often to passively accept and so perpetuate a closely related premise of 18th and 19th century racial science, namely that skin color is a transhistorical source and always a primary signifier of racial difference. Adhering to the general equation of race and skin color, investigation of black skin color in the ancient world has been undertaken over the past decades by a number of black classical scholars, including Frank Snowden Jr. and Lloyd Thompson, the latter a Cambridge graduate whose important study, Romans and Blacks, was published in 1989. Such scholarship was unquestionably bold and groundbreaking for its time. Indeed, these scholars were keenly aware of the importance of demonstrating to contemporary audiences that prejudice attached to skin color was not a universal phenomenon, and especially when they showed that in terms of the Greeks and Romans. But given the advances of critical race theory, we need to now to acknowledge that such scholarship proved only that the ancient Greeks and Romans did not define race the way we do today, that is primarily through skin color. They did, the scholarship did not prove that race itself did not exist in the ancient world. So although such scholarship is frequently cited, and I mean very frequently cited to me as the final word on race in antiquity, it really only serves as the beginning. Meaning we now need to determine how race was defined and functioned on its own terms in the classical world. And there are many scholars currently at work on this. In fact, black skin color itself is being rethought by Sarah Derbu, a scholar at Stanford University. Perhaps even more, we need as a discipline to recognize that such methods were only partial in their work, for they left white skin color completely uninterrogated. And while an important conclusion invariably follows from such scholarship, it is one that is almost never said out loud by members of our discipline. Namely, that just as black skin color did not have the same racial meaning in antiquity as it does today, neither did white skin color. And this is where the question of antiquity and legacy intersect, for it is undeniable that race matters today. And how we talk about the race of ancient Greeks and Romans also matters. It matters a lot. So I would like to finish off my comments with an example of our failures when it comes to race in the study of antiquity in hopes that we can find a better practice going forward. In 1995, the historian Noel Ignatiev published his seminal work, How the Irish Became White, a study that documented the ways the Irish community in the United States had used a range of social and political strategies to gain entry into the racial category of white in the early 20th century, making it possible for that group to distance itself from an African-American population with which it had long been identified by outsiders. A masterful illustration of the ways race operates as a social and historical construction, as classicists, we need to show much more awareness of a complementary process, that is, how the Greeks and Romans became white. A phenomenon that took place a long, long time after they were gone, and to a large extent took hold beginning in the very same 18th century, Lucius Outlaw already called our attention to. We can see an especially egregious example of such literal whitewashing of antiquity in the writings of Thomas Jefferson who once evoked the Roman playwright Terence to refute the idea that slavery per se, as opposed to natural ability, was limiting the capacity of black American slaves. And you can see what he wrote on the slide. Um, keep in mind that although Jefferson calls him of the white race, um, or of the race of whites, excuse me, not only was Terence, who was brought as a slave to Rome, said by Suetonius to have originated in Africa, but his physical, ex uh, his physical appearance was also explicitly described as fuscus, which Snowden and Thompson have translated to mean something like dark or black skinned. 
However, I am not so much interested today in confronting Jefferson's overt racism, racism because fish and barrel, but rather the omissions and silence that characterize the treatment of race still today in classics, tactics that are in some ways much more insidious. Published in 2013, the Blackwell Companion to Terence presents itself as a quote, comprehensive collection of essays by leading scholars, and it spans 500 pages. Significantly, none of the following words can be found in its index, race or even ethnicity, skin color, Africa, or the Latin affair, or fuscus. Questions about Terence's origin are condensed into mere passing of his provenance from Africa, which makes him sound like a potsher. Of his cognomen affair, the editors only vaguely assert that, quote, it indicates some connections with the continent, end quote. Moreover, in the final section on reception, readers can learn about Terence's influence on figures like the American writer Thornton Wilder, or even the 10th century German nun, Protzwit of Gonderheim, but there is no indication of Terence's position over the centuries in debates about the intellectual and literary capacity of Africans and slaves, or even recognition of his continuing importance in a black literary tradition that has long been reconstructed and commemorated outside the field of classics. Beginning with the writings of Phyllis Wheatley, a young slave woman who evoked Terence as her African literary ancestor. So I'm not necessarily intending to call out or shame the editors of this volume here. Um, indeed, the real problem is that the questions they ask of Terence, as well as the ones they avoid, are so typical in classical studies today that their notion of what is comprehensive is by all accounts completely acceptable to our field. But it is precisely what is acceptable when it comes to race and the study of classical antiquity that we need to radically reimagine. And I hope that this conversation can be one step along the journey. And I would just like to conclude by showing this slide of two different covers of Terence in Penguin. You can see the one from 1980, um, which uses one of the Fayum mummy portraits and the version that is currently being used, which presents a very different idea of who he was. So thank you all very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Denise, thank you. <clears throat> Let's move on then to our last and final presentation. And this is uh, from Danel, Danel Padilla Peralta is Associate Professor of Classics at Princeton University, where he also studied as an undergraduate. His research is centered on the Roman Republic and the early Roman Empire. And he also writes about classical reception in the contemporary US and Latin America. He is the author of Undocumented, a Dominican boy's odyssey from a homeless shelter to the Ivy League, and of Divine Institutions, Religions and Community in the Middle Roman Republic, which was just published last year. I think he's going to be talking today about his experience teaching a seminar on race and the inhumanities, and also the prospects or rewards of thinking with the work of Jose Esteban Munoz and others on disidentification and racial affects. Over to you, Danelle. Thanks so much for Rose for the introduction uh, and to my co-panelists. Um, uh, uh, it's a real delight uh, to be in your company. Um, a special shout out to Denise who wrangled uh, together contributions for uh, the cultural history of race uh, in antiquity volume uh, for Bloomsbury, which is coming out later this year. All y'all should get it. It has some sweet chapters. Um, and uh, to Paul and to Greg Wolf, my apologies for an overdue book proposal that will materialize someday in the not too distant future when I have day a child care. Um, but in the meantime, as, as Faroz stated, I am going to talk first about my experiences uh, co-teaching uh, a seminar this spring um, and pivot from there to an account of uh, affect um, uh, and its manifestations in the kinds of work that uh, my co-panelists and I are interested in, as well as in the kinds of work uh, that I see as crucial to pushing ahead with the vision outlined uh, by uh, the presentations of my co-panelists. So as Faroz said, I, I've been co-teaching with my colleague Tom Davies a, a seminar uh, this past semester uh, to undergraduates um, uh, that sports the slightly irreverent but all too serious title, Race and the Inhumanities. The course description uh, reads as follows, quote, 
Few technologies of domination have been wielded with more sweeping and devastating global consequence than race. The research and teaching taxonomies of predominantly white institutions such as Princeton bear witness both to this history and to the intricacy of those mechanisms that work to conceal it. Our first task in this course will be to trace the trajectory of race as concept and structure from the first millennium BCE to the early medieval period. Our case studies will encompass pharaonic Egypt, the Greco-Roman Mediterranean, the ancient Indian Ocean, and the period of Western Eurasian history conventionally and problematically termed medieval. For our second task, we will take our cue from Achille Mbembe, quote, racial thinking has been the ever-present shadow hovering over Western political thought and practice, end quote, and turn to the role of race in the formation of the intellectual disciplines around which universities like ours are organized, with a particular emphasis on the humanities. How has the field of classics been historically and institutionally implicated in the reproduction and entrenchment of race and racecraft? Philosophy, English, comparative literature, and why are humanists of a certain stripe so comfortable with and skilled at dodging discussions of race and racism's constitutive role in the formation of their epistemologies? So that's the course description. As advertised in it, the course is motored down two tracks. Uh, in the semester's first half, after an orientating session laying out the basic procedures for which we read Shelley Haley's classic Be Not Afraid of the Dark and Margot Hendricks's Coloring the Past, Rewriting Our Future, um, with Benita Seth's newly published The Origins of Racism, a critique of the history of ideas teed up in the background, we ran through several case studies. Week two uh, was on ancient Egypt, uh, and we keyed this week to the story of Sinue and the report of Venomoon uh, with the expert help of Ellen Morris's ancient Egyptian imperialism and Uros Matic's ethnic identities in the land of the pharaohs. For weeks three and four on ancient Greece and Rome, we relied heavily on Rebecca Kennedy, Sidney Royce, and Max Goldsman's reader, Race and Ethnicity in the Classical World, while spending time with Denise's Race, Antiquity, and Its Legacy, Benjamin Isaac's The Invention of Racism in Classical Antiquity, and Denise's excellent review of Isaac uh, in IG, uh, IJCT, and moving back a generation, the pioneering interventions of, of Frank Snowden Jr. Um, and Lloyd Thompson. The final two weeks before the midterm break, uh, a break that was truncated by our institution in a decision whose implications for student and faculty well-being in the time of the pandemic were calamitous to say the least, uh, were devoted to ancient India, uh, for which we chewed on the Purusha Sukta uh, and the laws of Manu with Nicholas Dirk's casts of mind close to hand, and medi uh, medieval uh, and med medievalities. Um, and here are ports of call where Las Siete Partidas, um, as well as some Byzantine material smartly and sensitively curated in Roland Betancourt's Byzantine intersectionality. And of course, Geraldine Heng's The Invention of Race in the European Middle Ages, um, which has been very important um, and a catalyst um, for uh, a number of uh, conversations um, in multiple pre-modern fields. Since the midterm pause, uh, our course has shifted primarily to the early modern and modern context in which those forms of racialization uh, most legible to us in the Euro-Americas uh, were stamped and to the disciplinary structures of knowledge that enter into symbiotic relationships uh, with these forms. Historiographies and ethnographies of the first contact have, have kept us quite busy, uh, think Sahagun and Lapito, um, as does Enlightenment philosophy, so Kant, Miners, and Hegel. Um, and on Hegel, I'll say that the absurdity of Hegel's position on Africa is beyond history, may not on its face require much anatomizing until one recalls how the Euro-American university has regularly reproduced the shutting out of Africa from history by offering few classes on African histories, cultures, or languages, and regularly starving uh, off funding and institutional support um, uh, from departments and program units that attempt to undertake this work. Uh, this is a story uh, that is regrettably all too obvious at Princeton um, and is manifestly in evidence elsewhere. We spent two weeks on classics and classicisms, uh, first in the company uh, of some of the standard eminences, so Winkelmann, Sir William Jones, Nietzsche at one end, uh, folks like Setis and Marchand on the other, uh, and then in the glow of a debate that, as Denise has reminded us, is not quite packed off into the yellowing pages of the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, this is the debate um, over Bernal and Bernal's legacy, uh, about which Denise wrote a very penetrating essay for Adelon. And between these two units on classicism, we've attended to museums, monumental architecture, and the reproduction of what my colleague Brooke Holmes has taken to calling proprioceptive classicism. Uh, Lyra Montero's exquisite medium essay, Power Structures, White Columns, White Marbles, uh, White Supremacy, uh, Mabel Wilson's Notes on the Virginia Capitol, Huey Copeland and Frank Wilderson III's interview, Red, Black, and White, uh, and Blue for Art Forum, uh, and Yoon Song Kim and Maya Isabel. Uh, Maya Isabel McRandillal's The Whitney Biennial for Angry Women uh, being uh, our major resources for that conversation. <laughs>
Through all of this, I keep returning to Shelley Haley's 2009 piece um, and its commitment uh, to quote, challenging the experiences of whites as the norm while at the same time centering its conceptual framework in the experiences of people of color, end quote. The intellectual architecture of scholarship at predominantly white institutions and within predominantly white disciplines has historically privileged the experiences of whites as the norm. One project that's central to Haley and important to my own work is how best to imagine and delineate a space of interpretation in which the experiences of folks of color are taken as normative, or even better, how best to transform hitherto white norm spaces of interpretation uh, into uh, POC normed ones. As a seminar has tried to demonstrate, this project unfolds across two dimensions. The first dimension concerns history in the ancient Mediterranean itself and the relevance of concepts of race to understanding that history. Uh, and the second concerns the history of scholarship on the ancient Mediterranean uh, as being marked uh, by the willful evasion of race and structures of racialization um, for the reasons laid out um, uh, by my co-panelists. For this work, I think it's important um, to understand that failure to um, take up um, and seriously entertain uh, research in other fields um, uh, on race um, and on its disciplinarization uh, amounts to a species of intellectual impoverishment. Um, in other words, uh, these the fields of pre-modern study um, around which we congregate, whether we designate them as classics or something else, um, are fields that will never reach uh, their intellectual uh, capa uh, capabilities, um, will never actually properly flourish uh, until and unless we make use of all of the resources that are available to us. And that includes entering into conversations with scholars who have developed far richer and more robust accounts of the operations of race and racialization. This habit of avoiding engagement um, is rooted in practices of curating and disseminating at every level of research and teaching uh, materials um, and modes of inquiry um, that blithely ignore methodologies that have been painstakingly built up um, uh, by uh, scholars of color in other fields. So let me give just one illustration for now, and then I will segue um, into uh, the second movement of my presentation. In 2004, uh, when I was an undergraduate, uh, Princeton's Center for the Study of Religion uh, circulated an announcement for funding that was available, quote, to support a limited number of junior and senior independent research projects related to the study of gender and religion in the African diaspora broadly defined, end quote. This announcement was passed on by the classics department's then director of undergraduate studies to juniors and seniors in the department with the words, I doubt that this is relevant to any of you, but just in case. End quote. So don't be that person. Don't rule out uh, the prospect uh, of this kind of disciplinary collaboration. Don't be this, don't be this dude. Facing up to this kind of occlusion and its history um, means at a minimum thinking quite carefully about questions of epistemic authority. Uh, and this is where I now tend um, for the remainder of my time. Under the banner of Black Scholarship Matters, Tatsion Benny Liu has encouraged colleagues in biblical and early Christian studies to ask, whose scholarship counts as scholarship in my guild? And this is the question to keep asking over and over and over again. Lately, I've grown increasingly frustrated at what for a lecture at the Stanford Humanities Center in the fall, I underlined as the enclosural properties of classics um, and uh, ancient Mediterranean history. Uh, the penchant for an insistently self-referential, ref citational, and bibliographical practice that takes little to no regard um, of the work uh, that's been carried out uh, by scholars of color in fields that ought to be in conversation with ancient Mediterranean studies. The feeling I get share some points of contact with that exasperation that Zoe Todd detailed in a 2016 essay on listening to Bruno Latour's Gifford lectures on natural theology at Edinburgh. Uh, so I'll quote um, uh, my favorite paragraph uh, from this essay. Um, I waited through the whole talk to hear the great Latour credit indigenous thinkers for their millennia of engagement with sentient environments, with cosmologies that enmesh people into complex relationships between themselves and all relations, and with climates and atmospheres as important points of organization and action. I waited. I waited with bated breath as I do through most of these types of events in the UK. Waited to hear a whisper of the lively and deep intellectual traditions born out in indigenous studies departments, community halls, fish camps, classrooms, band offices, and friendship centers across Turtle Island, North America, right now. European and North American academies are separated, after all, by a mere pond. 
And our kinship relations and ongoing colonial legacies actually weave us much more closely together than geography suggests. It never came. He did not mention Inuit or Anishinaabe or Nehiwa or any indigenous thinkers at all, end quote. The recurring problem uh, is that scholars from groups that have been violently minoritized in the Euro-Americas see their work quoted only when that work is legible to the diversity and equity machine whose operations have been so carefully scrutinized by Roderick Ferguson, uh, Sarah Ahmed, and others. In other words, BIPOC scholars uh, in particular are granted entry to the conversation in predominantly white preserves of racial colonial power only when their commodification is being reiterated and further entrenched. Diversity talk, that language of management whose grammar and syntax have been superbly picked apart uh, in Jackie Alexander's Pedagogies of Crossing or Sarah Meds on being included, is a species of languaging, a term I borrow from Ray Chow's Not Like a Native Speaker, that deliberately estranges Black and Indigenous scholars from entire sectors of knowledge production, uh, even and especially when their theory and world building speaks directly to the parameters and contents of that knowledge production. Awareness of this languaging's velvet gloved ruthlessness gets me cranky. It leads me to write cranky reviews as when I chastised the recently published volume on ecology and theology and antiquity for failing to quote, enter into dialogue with work on the coupling of ecological and racial thinking in antiquity or on the racial and race making underpinnings of global climate changes, fast and slow violences, end quote. But even to admit to this crankiness is not without its risks. And so now we are moving towards affect. So at a talk on Kahinda Wiley's classicisms earlier this spring that some of you may have attended, one of my more senior questioners attempted to interpolate my recourse to Wiley and to Black studies in explicating Wiley as exemplifying a species of resentment. Here we go again with the angry Black man business and is not attentive to those details that are presumed external or non-cognizable within a critical race paradigm. So here the questioner fantasized about a late 19th, early 20th century moment in art history that they believe to stand outside the wake of racial colonial colonialism. The same senior questioner had previously posted on social media their conviction that people like me needed to learn more of the world and, on, and about international scholarship before holding forth on the big questions. Come on, buddy. We've seen these deho on ba moves before. But rather than crank yank for the remainder of my time, let me close by outlining one project uh, that has me excited because it builds on an insight in Denise's uh, uh, race antiquity um, and its legacy, uh, because it holds some promise for initiating and maintaining conversations with scholars of color whose theoretical intervention should be making more waves in ancient Mediterranean studies than they have so far, and because it counters the senior questioner's misguided strategy of excavating my own presumed affect of resentment by calling into view a far more expansive and multidimensional orientation to questions of racial affect. An invitation to deliver a keynote for the Friedman in the Roman World Conference at uh, uh, UC Santa Barbara in fall 2019 gave me an opportunity to work up an idea uh, that had slowly been congealing since my graduate school days on the West Coast. The promise of racial affect theory in making clearer sense of the psychological tensions of Roman manumission and freed person experience at Rome as figured and refracted uh, in texts such as Petronius' Satirica. Here's the appetizer. In recent decades, psychoanalysis has been put to work hard in histories of early modern racial formations. Where it hasn't made all that many inroads is in classics in ancient history, uh, even as the tide of publications on the cultural psychology of ancient Greece and Rome rises higher and higher. Freudian and post-Freudian approaches have received some take up among scholars of students of Greek uh, uh, and uh, Roman literature and religion, uh, though with little regard for the generative possibilities of bringing psychoanalysis to bear on ancient constructions of race. So for the edited volume that is growing out of the Santa Barbara conference, I thought of attempting to redress this deficit by modeling how a Latin text that has long stood at the head of regularly consulted sources on the history of Roman slavery and manumission can be opened up through attention to theories of racial melancholy. To be sure, psychoanalytic approaches have been brought to bear on the literary representation of Roman slavery, uh, not without controversy. Where the essay departs from these earlier applications in its, its, is in its commitment to excavating what Denise Ferreira da Silva evocatively termed the analytics of raciality, uh, as these manifest in and work to establish parameters for the psychic life of the Roman free person. In the 80 years since Freud's passing, uh, theories of racial melancholy have gained a head of steam chiefly, but not only in histories of racism and colonialism. Leading the way in Anglophone circles are Asian American scholars such as David Eng and Shinji Han, Annie Cheng, um, and in creative nonfiction encounters with racial melancholy, one might also cite the essays of Kathy Park Hong. Uh, 
But most of all, I have in mind Eduardo Bonilla Silva's argument set out with clarity and verve in a recent address uh, to the American Sociological Association that there are, quote, emotions specific to racialized societies, end quote. As the work uh, of Denise and other trailblazers in the study of race and antiquity um, uh, has shown, racialization and race making operate in the ancient Mediterranean. And as the work of David Constant, Bob Castor, Ruth Kasten, Elena Baraz, Don Latiner, and Dinos Patheros has demonstrated, we can write the histories of emotions in Greco Roman antiquity. So, why not attempt to delineate the presence and agency of racialized emotions in the ancient Mediterranean? As my entry point into this work, I've taken up Hermoros' diatribe in the Cana Trimalchionis. Uh, reading it for evidence of several propositions, that there is something that we can call a melancholic affect, that this affect is a racial ontological signature, that its workings are perceptible in Petronius, and that we can decompose it into two main elements, paranoia about being the butt of a joke and the reflexive turn to autobiography as a way of voicing but also suppressing trauma. You're going to have to wait for this volume to come out, uh, whenever it does arise from the shadows of press time. Uh, but for now, I leave you with the encouragement to rethink your subfields and the enclosural practices that define them. Why not open up? Why not make community with other scholars in other fields and not simply the great white whales, Latour and others hailing from white Francophony? Why not be more inclusive? It will help diversify the epistemic identities uh, that define our field. And it will help finally divest our field of the white identitarian epistemics that have long stamped it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Donnell. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you to all three speakers. That was fantastic. And I've learned a lot from your presentations and I'm sure there will be lots of questions and comments from the attendees. So um, as I said before, um, we're now gonna have a period of discussion and Q&A. If you do have questions, you could uh, put them in the Q&A section of the, of the computer window and um, I can then relay them to the panel. I'm not sure that everyone can see the questions which are typed into the Q&A box, but in any case, I will paraphrase them and I'll do my best to present the spirit of the question, if not repeated verbatim to the, to the panel. Um, we've, we've already got one question there, um, which um, I, I can relay onwards, and that has to do with... Uh, uh, Marcusean theory on diversity in curriculum as a form of repressive tolerance. Uh, and the conclusion that is reached according to his theory is that one must exert prejudice in the curriculum in order to be truly tolerant. Uh, so the question is, how do we overcome this limitation? Do we need to re retain objectivity under the guise of academic neutrality uh, or in an already biased world uh, engage in this Marcusean style censorship in the hope that this will lead to a kind of tolerance. And what, how does this look like to you from the perspective of classics? I apologize if I've not been as clear as the questioner has been in their, uh, in their presentation of the question. Any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly. I mean, so the, the questioner is referring uh, to this uh, 2007 uh, paper by Stephen Brookfield uh, entitled Diversifying Curriculum as the Practice of Repressive Tolerance, um, which came out in Teaching in Higher Education. Uh, and I, I've been thinking about the essay uh, around which this paper is structured. Uh, this is Marcuse's 1965 uh, uh, essay, Repressive Tolerance. Um, because it um, bears directly on um, debates about the need for viewpoint diversity. Um, I, I, I mean, I have to be upfront. Um, I, I, I think that um, efforts um, uh, to um, call for uh, viewpoint diversity um, often act um, as Trojan horse style operations um, uh, that are designed um, to take um, uh, investments, uh, real potent uh, and uh, strategic investments uh, in equity and diversity and decolonizing the curriculum and turn them around in the service um, of right, right wing ideologies um, by saying that, well, if we are being called to be tolerant, then we must be tolerant of all perspectives. Um, so the answer that Brookfield works through um, in dialogue um, with Marcuse um, uh, is this. Um, I, I, it's probably best just to read uh, the uh, 
relevant paragraph um, from, from the article. Um, in Marcuse's view, the only way to break the sort of log jam um, is to practice liberating tolerance. The educator must try to, quote, break the established universe of meaning so that people are, quote, freed from the prevailing indoctrination, which is no longer recognized as indoctrination. Uh, in a society living under false consciousness, people, uh, and here again, Marcuse is quoted, are indoctrinated by the conditions under which they live and think in which they do not transcend. To help them emerge from this, they need to realize that truth is manipulated, that the facts are established, mediated by those who made them. The objective truth is a liberatory truth concerning the need to overthrow the dominant ideology of capitalism and white supremacy, and it must always take precedence over a supposedly respectful but ultimately repressive tolerance of all viewpoints. To Marcuse, quote, tolerance cannot be indiscriminate and equal. It cannot protect false words and wrong deeds which demonstrate that they contradict and counteract the possibilities of liberation. Providing a smorgasbord of alternative perspectives in the name of a pluralist tolerance of diversity only ensures that the radical ones are marginalized by the dominant consciousness. I mean, that's that's really it. Like, I, I don't really have to say anything more because both Brookfield and Mark Hughes hit the nail on the head as far as I'm concerned. I might just come in there as well. Um, so one of the... Um, elements of the uh, teaching survey that I didn't have a chance to talk about today uh, was around reading lists. Um, uh, it's a fairly probably well-trodden bit of ground in terms of how contentious it is, always surprisingly. Um, uh, so uh, I asked people whether they would be willing to um, make their reading list more inclusive, um, to which the vast majority of responses um, uh, slightly kind of oh well I, I'm not um, I don't want to discriminate um uh, and there was a, a lot of anxiety being expressed over being seen to discriminate by making your reading lists more inclusive um uh and there seemed to be within that um maybe not um expressed explicitly within the survey data but certainly implicit behind that uh, an idea that a meritocracy exists, that what goes on our reading list is because it is the best work there, uh, and therefore it's stuff that our, our students should read. Um, and yet there are so many studies <laughs> that show time and time again that a meritocracy does not exist, that does not govern what we um, uh, decide goes at the top of reading lists or, or indeed in many other um, uh, areas of life. Um, so uh, I think there needs to be um, an abandonment of an idea of meritocracy until a genuine meritocracy um, maybe does exist. Um, uh, and also not to assume that you're putting something on your reading list that is worse than something written by a white person because it was written by a person of color um th th there is so much in there that is problematic to me um and uh so yeah i'm not as eloquent as danell but um, um that that is where i would start is to to start challenging um that idea that we choose things because they uh, have inherent value uh, and really think about where that value lies um, and, and to make the effort to put on um, women, <laughs> people of colour more generally, um, uh, that work exists. You might just have to do a little bit of legwork to find it. Um, just to remind everyone, I think the idea is that we'll have this discussion for another 30 minutes or so. Is that that sounds right to me? And I and I hope that that's okay with everyone. Unfortunately, we we need to um, stop at that point, but of course we hope the conversations will carry on as well outside of Zoom. Um, Zina, this is a kind of follow-up to you in a in a manner of speaking. Um, how can we get beyond objections such as it's only political correctness or it's a political correctness trend that's going to blow over that people continually raise within and outside of classics uh, as a way of dismissing critical thinking about race, for instance? So I, I wonder if you or indeed any of the others also have anything to say about this. Uh, so I think, so my response to that has been to try and generate data sets um, 
to show the extent of the issue to undercut that response that it, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so with the conference data, we can see that this is pretty much unchanged since 1991. Um, uh, and I think if we can, sometimes people respond better to a little bit of um, statistical data um, uh, to show that a problem does exist. Um, how to how to counteract um, bullshit guy for for want of a better term? Um, I don't know. I think there are people that are, are so entrenched in their views that I'm not sure that it matters what I say. Um, uh, but I hope that maybe there are some people in the middle ground who might um, come over to uh, my way of thinking. Um, and I suppose the other way I've tried to do it is to share some of my own personal experiences it's not fun to share those things um uh but to show people a little bit of the reality of what it's like um to be someone like me uh working in this field um uh and that if we share those stories um people might realize that actually this impacts on people's lives it's not just my academic life that is affected you know some of that's deeply unpleasant to me on a personal level um uh, so it does matter. Um, all right, let's um, let's move on to another question, and I think this is for Denise. Um, to what extent do you think the distinctive historical circumstances of classics as discipline and profession in the United States, the extraordinary lens the class system the decades after the Civil War went to accommodate racist white supremacist scholars? particularly Basil Gildersley, but also those associated with his ostensibly uh, Northern alma mater, Princeton, sorry, Donnell, such as Andrew Fleming West, uh, helps explain its imperviousness to race as a lens for viewing classical antiquity. So yeah, um, Judah, thank you for the question. Um, I, think, uh, I think there's absolutely um, a history of, race and classics that is nation specific to the United States and and um, my current project I'm trying to sort of go beyond the 19th century that Martin Bernal looked at and work on eugenics in the early 20th century and how that um, intersected with classical historians um, so I'm interested very much in that and I've defined it as an American project but I sort of want to say just two things in response to that. So I completely agree with you that we have to attend to the American history. Um, but I also think that from the times that I've been resident in the UK, I've been often told that race is an American problem. And I think that that's um, something that people in the UK have to really grapple with. When I was first um, trying to talk about race um, as a classicist in the UK, Paul Gilroy was writing things like Ain't No Black in the Union Jack. And no classicist knew about that work. So I think that there's also, um, you know, people from the UK and, and Faroz and Zina are, are very aware of that and doing a lot of that kind of work. But I think that um, it shouldn't just be an American problem. I also think that the challenge today in the United States is really breaking through a certain kind of complacency. And just to give a very small anecdote, I saw on MSNBC the other day that Joe Scarborough was lecturing Eddie Gloud about, um, Frederick Douglass and how racist our forefathers were. And so I think there's a certain complacency in the United States about admitting this, but not that. And I think we have to try to figure out as classicists, how to break, as historians really, how to break through that and to, to make those kinds of conversations a lot more uncomfortable. Um, so um, those are my two comments and maybe um, people can fill in the, the UK background for that. Thanks, thanks. There used to be a cliche that Brits don't talk about race, Americans don't talk about class, and no one talks about empire. But I think I think actually things have changed a bit, uh, a little bit uh, since the days when that used to to circulate. Um, all right, um, here's a, a couple of questions as well for Denise. But I actually invite everyone on the panel as well to respond. Um, about methodology, if we distinguish race from ethnicity and accept the claim that skin color is not a major driver of racism in the ancient Greek and Roman world, then how would we set about establishing that among these people's race as distinct from ethnicity was both a live concept and one which underpinned 
racism as distinct from ethnic stereotyping. Denise, do you want to take that one first? Um, so um, I think that, that part of what I've tried to advocate for is much clearer, um, a necessity of much more clearly defining our methodology. Um, Nisha McSweeney has an amazing essay about how we might try to distinguish race and ethnicity in the upcoming cultural history of race in antiquity volume. And so I'm not trying to get rid of ethnicity. I personally prefer the terminology of race because of the kind of work that it allows, I think it allows me to do. Um, but I think that the bigger problem is just not being clear about how we are applying those terms. And so I think that's what I would advocate. In terms of, um, maybe, this, maybe I misunderstood the question, but in terms of where we might look, um, people have talked about, for example, the ancient environmental theory as a form of racist ideology in antiquity. That is the theory that suggests that um, human capacities were developed um, in relation to where people lived in the world. And that does have a reemergence in Western racism. It will eventually be replaced by scientific racism. But the idea that the environment determines human character um, is something that comes out of antiquity. So I think there are definitely um, places where I feel comfortable using the word race. I just think um, we all need to be a lot more um, open about how we're defining both of those terms when we use them. And I'll, I'll jump in here to, to reiterate the, the need and urgency for definitional clarity. Um, so I, I, I take to heart uh, Simon's apprehension that um, you know, one does run the risk of reinscribing the nasty errors of 18th and 19th century ideologies. But I mean, there, there's a sort of two-parter here in, that crystallizes for me in, in thinking about um, the, the, the predicament uh, that we might find ourselves in. Um, the first part has to do um, with our acceptance uh, in ancient Mediterranean studies um, of heuristics for analysis that are invariably presentist or early modernist and modernist in um, their construction, but that we use, you know, sometimes with due attention to the contextualization of these ideas, but most of the time, just very casually. Think, for example, of religion or economics. The, the, these are these are structures for organizing and interpreting uh, ancient Mediterranean material that do not have ready or direct um, uh, correspondences to concepts that would have been mobilized by ancient Mediterranean communities, but that nonetheless we use for the purposes of interpreting. Um, so why why not um, make use of the vocabulary and the methodologies of race? Um, we have to do so cautiously, um, but here is where to take up uh, one aspect of, of Denise's answer just now, we could dwell um, with definitions of race uh, that have been elaborated quite systematically and carefully by scholars working in other fields. Let's you know take medieval studies as, 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 as one example. So Geraldine Hang in her book, which has you know not not gone without some controversy, um, has a definition of race um, that I, I find quite usable. Um, Race is one of the primary names uh, uh, we have, she writes, a name we retain for the strategic, epistemological, and political commitments it recognizes that is attached to a repeating tendency of the gravest import to demarcate human beings through differences among humans that are selectively essentialized as absolute and fundamental in order to distribute positions and powers differentially to human groups. Race making thus operates at specific historical occasions in which strategic essentialisms are posited and assigned to a variety of practices and pressures, so as to construct a hierarchy of peoples for differential treatment. My understanding thus is that race is a structural relationship for the articulation and management of human differences rather than a substantive concept. Is this uh, a, a, an utterly unimpeachable definition? No, I mean, that one could take issue with various parts of it, but it, it serves to make plain what the rewards are um, of thinking with race in the interpretation of pre-modern cultures um, and of attempting to move beyond some of the paradigms of race that are legible to us in the 20th and 21st century moment. Again, here is where, whether we use a hang style approach to race or think about um, in Karen and Barbara Fields terms, racecraft or range in pretty much any other direction, um, the key is to make use of definitional parity as, as, as an aid to the recontextualization of antiquity's racial paradigms. 
If I could just add very quickly something about teaching. One of the reasons why I think it's such a powerful word in teaching, um, when I teach my class on race and ethnicity and antiquity, um, when I first started, I used to ask my students, what's the most memorable thing you've learned? And they learn and they say that race is not universal. And I say, what come, you know, what are the consequences for that in your life? And they say we have to figure out why we think the way we do today racially. I mean, it just activates an idea that we can never take race for granted. And I think that's been extremely important in the classroom. And my students absolutely respond to that very, very powerfully. Okay, um, let's move on to another question. I think I'll take that as an answer to Simon's question uh, about whether race, in fact, uh, and using words like race tends to reproduce a kind of 19th century mindset. And so are there other ways that we might talk about the problems that we've been discussing today? Um, uh, a comment here or a question about um, Roman archaeology conferences in Brazil. Uh, and the people have been, the, the, the questioner knows people have been studying Lusitania, but also Northern Africa and other provincial locations. Um, all these participants would be non-white, uh, but, but the questioner feels this, this issue runs deeper in, in Brazil. Uh, are we concentrating too much on Anglophone dialogue and is this contradictory to the intention of inclusiveness? I guess is one way of asking what this person is saying to all of us. Should we be looking at non-Anglophone conversations about race? We've not really talked about France or the French colonies in Africa or French studies of uh, Roman of the histories of the Roman Empire and so on and so forth. I wonder what our um, panel might have to say on this. Uh, so um, I think there is always, uh, it's very easy just to slip into focusing on, on the Anglophone. Um, uh, I looked, so in terms of the conference data, so I chose the two biggest Roman archaeology conferences. Um, I could arguably go and gather more data uh, from other uh, conferences worldwide. Um, uh, but it's 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 a lot of work, um, uh, and um, I would maybe encourage other people to do similar analyses of of, um, of, of uh, different uh, conferences. For example, I know that um, things have been done on the International Papyrology Conference um, that is similar. Again, that's on the um, data for that's on the Everyday Orientalism blog. Um, uh, the Roman Archaeology Teaching Survey was sent out worldwide, so, um, so that did include people from uh, from everywhere that I could find. Um, uh, there were big gaps in that, uh, where there were no, no respondents. Um, uh, in spite of my best efforts. Um, uh, and there were some differences in that in terms of attitudes according to where people were based. Um, uh, so for example, in the US, people seem to be a little bit further ahead in their thinking around the reading list question that there, there was less um, kind of clutching of handbags. Um, uh, from from US based scholars um, than a uh, particularly from uh, Europe, uh, mainland European um, scholars. Um, so I think we can kind of tease out some of those differences and, and include those um, people in our conversations. Um, I, I'm imagining that was a question from Juliana, in which case I hope I've answered her question. <laughs> Sorry, others want to respond to that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I would add only that um, the work that we're trying to sort of model in, in this panel um, and, and the work that, that Zina and others are so keen to um, undertake um, is global work. Like, I, I, obviously, um, I mean, we're performing in this Anglophone context. Um, I have some familiarity with Hispanophone trends. I could say that, guess what? <laughs> some of the issues we have flagged in the Anglophone are also true in the Hispanophone. Um, and there, I think the challenge is to build up collectives of research um, that can pursue this, um, because to examine both the historical and present day manifestations of disciplinary exclusion and occlusion um, that 
uh, tend to materialize around the specter of race is work that no one scholar could ever hope to carry out on their own uh, and execute at a high level. So this is, and, and, and Juliana's intervention here um, is, uh, as I see it, um, a, a summons uh, to partnership um, uh, and a summons to collaboration um, across language, national and regional lines. Um, so let's get going. Let's do this. I mean, we, we can do it. Just hit us up. We're here. Uh, good point. Yeah, I like, uh, we are the ones we've been waiting for to quote a former president of the United States. Okay, uh, let's move on to uh, another uh, couple of related questions, in fact, from the two Catherines, if I may call them that. Uh, one is about the pressure on providing closure, solutions, optimism, and the, the kinds of racialized affect involved in making those sorts of gestures and relatedly uh, also perhaps the issue of staying silent on the on the question uh, of race and racism uh, is something that Denise was alluding to in her uh, in her remarks uh, would anyone like to respond to these related questions so I can start on the question of silence and omission I mean I think that um, what I would like to suggest is that we have both an ethical and an intellectual imperative to do better. I mean, one of the things that I think I find often in these conversations is that people will sort of dismiss it, it's, it's not my opinion, but as a sort of issue of social justice rather than the way we think. And I think that both of those things are exceedingly important. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's been very damaging that, as I said in my talk, that people will often cite the work of Frank Snowden Jr. and the work of Lloyd Thompson, which is incredible work and was extremely meaningful in its time. But what they absolutely avoided taking on board um, was the question of white skin color in antiquity. Um, so there have been so many ways that classical scholars have stayed silent when the Greeks and Romans have been appropriated for very what various white nationalist projects. And they've been very halting in the way that they do that. And I think that that's, like I say, not just an ethical question, but an intellectual question and it shouldn't be acceptable. We should not be able to make those kinds of errors either when we speak or by a mission. And so I think that's that's absolutely critical. I completely agree um, with Catherine. Okay, uh, I'm going to selectively move through some of the questions now because we're not going to have time unfortunately to get to all of them. Uh, but here um, I think perhaps is one that we might address. Um, and this is about we can Roman attitudes to all cultures that they considered as, as barbarian. So when we're talking about race, we're dealing with a whole range of different peoples in antiquity, Greeks, Romans, Persians, Egyptians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, how useful is it to talk about race uh, when we're dealing with the fact that there is this complexity to the ancient situation. I'm paraphrasing this person's question. I may be reorienting it in a way that he doesn't approve of, but uh, I wonder if you have anything to say on that. Anyone want to respond? Can you just maybe rephrase that for us? Is, is the person asking about how we kind of use modern ideas about race? And okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read out the question verbatim. I would be interested in how the panelists interpret the Greek and Roman attitudes to all cultures that they considered as barbarian, since they were more exposed to white barbarians than African or Asian ones. Um, so maybe Zena's better able to answer this, but I think that's what she's talking about a lot is that we think of them as being more exposed to that because we study that connection more. And I think part of the, the challenge that we face, even if we ourselves, as Zena said, aren't, haven't been trained in this material, is to try to come to a better understanding of it and to present a more balanced um, view of the ancient imaginary that acknowledges the spaces different groups held and not just groups um, to their West in Europe, groups in Western and Northern Europe. I think we have to do much better with that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think 
I think I would probably take some issue with the question. I'm not sure that we can say that um, people in the Roman world were more exposed to people who were white than they were to people who were brown or black. Um, uh, there is huge amounts of evidence for um, movement around the empire. Um, uh, um, even if you were just a, a soldier moving around, um, uh, but also in trades. Um, so I think I, th I think we need to be attentive to the assumptions that we make about the Roman world. Um, uh, and you know, there was the big drama several years ago where it was a BBC bite size dared to show a, a person of colour in a Roman Britain setting. Um, uh, and yet, why, where is the drama in that? <laughs> um, there is good evidence for that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I just wouldn't assume that um, that the Roman world was was so insular. Um, that's not to say that it didn't have difficulties and problems. Um, uh, but I think that idea of who saw who more frequently might need some adjustment. Okay, uh, perhaps we can move on to a very last question. Uh, and this has to do with, again, I'm going to combine more than one question in my clumsy fashion. So forgive me if I'm, I'm not being as articulate as I should be. Um, are there ways in which we can move beyond simply reproducing the views of the Greeks and Romans? Are we merely being ethnocentric when we talk about race in uh, antiquity? Are we, are we just saying what the Greeks and Romans said? So are we in a way repeating their own ideological biases? Uh, and I guess this could also be related to teaching. When we're teaching Greek and Roman antiquity, should we be teaching these subjects in a different way so as to be uh, more challenging so as to be uh, less accepting of the kind of internal biases and ideological energies that are coming out of our sources. I can just oh. say, I think it, I'm sorry. No, you go, Denise, you go. <laughs> um, just very quickly. Um, I think it, a lot of it sort of depends on context and we have to be very flexible as we move forward. I think right now, for example, my students get a lot out of studying the ancient Germans from the Roman perspective, because there's been so much of an attempt to talk of, you know, to sort of allied whiteness in antiquity. And so they're sort of shocked to find out that we can consider the Germans racially different from the Romans. Um, and that's important in this moment of white nationalism um, and some of its conversations being much more public, I guess, than they used to be. So I think part of it is also when we teach being attentive to the kinds of topics that are going to most disrupt our students' sense of ancient racial practices. Yeah, I, so in, in the spirit of modeling a kind of correction on the fly to one aspect of my remarks earlier, like I, I, I want to flag an area where I feel in order to sort of make meaningful progress, we have to be exceedingly vigilant. Um, and it's something that's flagged by Catherine Harlow in the, um, in the chat um, uh, with reference to a Guardian essay that, that I love. Um, so if we are to sort of make meaningful strides, um, we can't approach the task of entering into conversation with um, the work of scholars of color as yet another round of extractivism. Uh, so uh, this, as I see it, um, entails two ethical commitments. Um, the first is to is is for all of us um, to commit um, uh, in local and um, uh, uh, in, in in national and and, and supranational ways um, to the erection. Uh, of a scholarly infrastructure um, that faithful to Juliana's reminder um, uh, in uh, the Q&A um, is always considerate of um, and seeks actively to work against um, uh, those patterns um, by which siloification uh, across racial and language and racial linguistic um, aligns takes place in the academy. 
But this work also has to go hand in hand um, with the determination to engage in partnerships that don't simply at the end of the day reassert or reinscribe uh, the contentedness and complacency of whiteness when it makes use of blackness and brownness. Um, so it's not just about citing the right scholars or like attending the right talks or like curating elegant reading lists. Like you, you gotta do research, you gotta read stuff. Like, I, and you, you should be reading, you should be educating yourself, but that, that's, that's really not where this ends. Like the, the global vision here is one in which we radically reorient the production of knowledge in ways that are more equitable and that go towards addressing the systemic deficits that my co-panelists have flagged. So to that end, you have to think about the entire enterprise of what you do and seek to unsettle and displace your own inherited assumptions about what it is that constitutes this field that we call classics or ancient Mediterranean studies. Um, and to say, all right, like what would it mean for there to be a surrender of white uh, epistemic power in these spaces? Like what would it mean for that power um, to, bit, to bite the dust. And that doesn't get people upset. Like you are gonna deal with folks who are like, oh my God, you're calling for like white people to be eliminated from the profession. Nah, buddy, I'm not saying that. Like I, I'm saying that like we have to reevaluate what it is that our discipline manages to do so brutally and efficaciously, the perpetuation of white epistemic power, and then make use of all of the tools at our disposal for um, blunting this and then over time, uh, hollowing it out, right? Um, Zina, would you want to add anything to that or sh quick response? No, no, okay, all right. I think, uh, thank you very much. I think in fact, we're out of time sadly. And uh, I say sadly because this discussion could go on for much longer, needs to go on for much longer, but we need to wrap it up over here. Um, this conversation is just one of many that needs to happen. I'm sure you will agree. And I'm sure we'll be carrying this forward further in, in many different ways. Please take up the spirit of our panelists. I encourage you all to, to read their work, to listen to what they've been saying, to go out and, and put this into, into practice. Uh, let me thank Paul Cartledge again for hosting this event to Fiona Har for her support. And thanks especially to our three panelists, to Zina Kamash, to Denise Mikoski, and to Danelle Padilla Peralta for their superb remarks today. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>